There's a really good reason why Western media and governments use terms like forced labour, concentration camps and even genocide when they're talking about Xinjiang, China. This is because they want to appeal to people's emotions and these phrases really do appeal to people's emotions. Those people then start thinking, oh my God, this is terrible. We must do something about these, these bad things. We must do something about these atrocities. And this is called manufacturing consent. Consent to allow these other Western nations to impose sanctions on China. And we've seen this before. We've seen this all before. We've seen this just before the Iraq war with the weapons of mass destruction. There was a huge um, campaign of manufacturing consent to invade Iraq. And what happened in the end? Not a single weapon of mass destruction was found. Anyway, what we're going to talk about today is this issue in Xinjiang. And uh, if you want to learn more, stick around. Welcome back to the Barrett channel. Welcome to another video. My name is Lee. If you've not visited the channel before, I run this channel with my son, Ollie. We do tech, we do factories, we do travel and food, and we also do opinion pieces. As I said earlier today, we're going to talk about Xinjiang. So the UK, the EU, the USA and Canada have imposed sanctions against China, saying that they're committing genocide against the Uyghur people in Xinjiang. And in return, China have imposed sanctions on a number of individuals and organizations in those countries. So in this video, I want to explore why these Western nations are committing so much money and giving so much airtime to attacking China and accusing them of genocide against these Uyghur people. So the Western nations, and the USA in particular, want to split Xinjiang from the rest of China. Now the reason they want to do this is due to China's Belt and Road project. In the next 20 years, maybe sooner, China will become the dominant economic world power and their Belt and Road Initiative is central to achieving this goal. Other countries now have a non-Western choice for cooperation and partnerships and many of them are choosing that other choice which is China, especially Africa and Latin America who in the past have been treated very poorly by the USA and other Western nations. The USA are also becoming more and more concerned with the amount of international trade that is starting to be settled in RMB. Even though it's still nothing as much as the US dollar, it is growing very quickly. And with the introduction of the digital RMB, which will happen very soon, this will only increase the amount of trade that is settled in RMB. And this challenges the hegemony of the American US dollar. So Xinjiang is a very strategic area for the Belt and Road Initiative both things coming into China and things going out of China. So it seems the USA are trying to do everything in their power to destabilize the region in order to put a stop to the Belt and Road project. It's also worth mentioning that the Xinjiang area is very rich with gas and oil resources. Now it's not necessary that the USA want to get their hands on these oil and gas resources, it's just they don't want China to either. And this is, I believe, why we're seeing all these accusations like sterilization, like forced labor, and even genocide being leveled against China. So these accusations of genocide have been pushed for about three years and come from three main sources. The first being the leaked government documents called the so-called China Cables, which paint a picture of a dystopian surveillance state. Secondly, from exiled Uyghurs, or third, from either organizations that claim to be independent or supposedly academics who seem to write reports that are unimpeachable. I'm now going to show you a short clip from Daniel Dumbrell's channel um, regarding one of these Uyghur exiles and it just shows you how there's massive holes in some of their stories. Uh, or the testimonies like that of Tersene, a supposed concentration camp survivor who was propped up in a major way by CNN and BBC recently and is someone who's on the third version of her story, wildly deviating from the first, and whose passport renewal date was oddly the only thing blurred out by the CNN report. Because it turns out it's a giant hole in the story that nobody's talking about. It would be odd enough if China would grant a passport to someone they're trying to genocide, but it would be even more odd that her passport was renewed during the time she said she was under arrest. So the need to blur that out becomes quite apparent now. 
And the main studies that we see in Western mainstream media have come from primarily four institutions, and they all center around Adrian Zenz. The first organization is the Chinese Human Rights Defenders, and very similar to the World Uyghur Congress, they are funded by the US government through the National Endowment for Democracy, NED. And this is an organization that has now taken on what used to be the covert work of the CIA. The third organization is ASPI. ASPI are an Australian think tank and they receive a lot of funding from the military industrial complex in the USA. People like Raytheon, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, who are weapons manufacturers. And finally, we have the New Lines Institution, who again claim to be independent, but again have been shown not to be independent by Max Blumenthal and Ajit Singh of the Grey Zone. Now I'm going to move on to some of these reports that are produced. Now, if you notice about these reports, there's a name that appears on almost every one of these reports, and that is the name of Adrian Zenz. And he often talks about all these horrors that are apparently coming out of Xinjiang. And news organisations like CNN, Associated Press and the BBC all reference these reports in their stories without any fact-checking whatsoever. And one of Adrian Zenz's reports on forced labor was one of the main factors in securing sanctions against China in the US Congress. And another one of his reports claims that more than one million Uyghurs are being detained in concentration camps in Xinjiang. Now this report was based on an interview with eight people and to my mind some really really fantasy mathematics. And one of Zenz's most ridiculous claims is the one about birth control in the Xinjiang area. If you analyse the figures closely, he claims that every woman in Xinjiang would have between four and eight UID birth control surgeries every single day. And I'm now going to show a short clip from Max Blumenthal that explains this in, in more detail. One of Zenz's major claims to me is absolutely shocking and was obviously overlooked by all the media organisations and the US State Department that conveyed this, his conclusions without examining the claims. And that was that 80% of all net added IUD placements in China were performed in Xinjiang, despite the fact that the region makes up only 1.8% of the nation's population. So what's going on here? It looks like on the surface, Zens is saying that it's, 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 it's ex explosive, that 80% of all IUD insertions are in this place that only comprises 2% of the population. In reality, if you look at his source, the 2019 China Health Statistics Yearbook, uh, which we did at the gray zone, and that's you know, his only source, the number of new IUD insertion procedures in Xinjiang accounted for only 8.7% of China's total. So it looks like he was off by a factor of 10. When someone pointed this out, a critic of Zentz, he then said, well, I was just talking about new net insertions. Uh, I wasn't just cooking statistics. But, and so he basically calculated it based on new net IUD uh, in, devices added minus those removed and came up with 80% of the national total in 2018. But he ignores that in other provinces like Henan, there were 2,600, 206,000 new net IUD insertions. So that would have comprised 69% of the total in China. Hebei province, meanwhile, registered 61%. So if you combine all these, they amount to 210% of national net insertions. It doesn't make sense. You can't go over 100%. And then beyond that, these are provinces and areas that are populated almost entirely by Han Chinese people. So where is the specific focus on uh, reducing the Uyghur population here? In fact, China's experiencing a problem in general with uh, declining birth rate, as uh, many other countries are. Then finally, I mean, I just can't help it. I just, I, I know that I'm going over time, but I just can't help it. Adrian Zentz asserted that the Chinese government inserted between 800 and 1400 IUDs per capita each year in Xinjiang. Per capita, that means per person. 
which means that every woman in the province would have had to have gone undergone anywhere from four to eight IUD surgeries every day. I mean, with so much time on the operating table, how do they have time for the forced labor that he claims? It just doesn't make sense. And it shows how truly sloppy he is. So it appears there are many holes in Zen's work if you uh, submit his work to scrutiny. However, that video is not what this is about. There's been a great job of that done by Max Blumenthal and Ajit Singh over at the Grey Zone. So what I'll do, I'll leave a link to their reporting in the description down below. Personally, I think it's disgraceful how these organizations and the Western media who employ Adrian Zenz's services push his reports out to millions and millions of people without even doing the simplest basic fact checking on what he's writing. They seem to be stuck in an echo chamber of fake experts and activists with the sole purpose of pushing this hostile narrative against China. So something that Western countries know and also Middle Eastern countries know this too. And that's why Middle Eastern countries are very supportive of the way Xinjiang and China are dealing with radicalism. However, Western countries are not seeing that because Western countries have a vested interest in stopping the rise of China. And that is that it was well known that in, during the Syrian war, a great place to recruit ISIS fighters was in the Xinjiang area. And many of them were radicalized. And, you know, Western countries know this and the USA knows this. And the US also knows that once the civil war has ended in Syria, many of these fighters will want to turn home. And the US are hoping that they will return home to Xinjiang and start to cause trouble and unrest in that Xinjiang region in order to destabilize China. What this will lead to, they want them to radicalize more people in Xinjiang and ultimately causing a civil war which will ultimately destabilize the Xinjiang area. Because the US want Xinjiang to become separate, not part of China. And this is the reason China have increased security to such a high level in the Xinjiang area. And they're also taking those radicals or people who be maybe marginally radicalized and they're putting them into correction centers to deal with this issue. And what you need to remember is China is a country of 1.4 billion people and they are more than capable of dealing with their own affairs. So it's, I think the West need to keep their nose out and let China deal with things themselves. I think what the West are hoping and trying to do is put so much pressure onto China that they will release these radicals from these correction facilities. These radicals will then go and radicalize even more people in the hope that they will destabilize the Xinjiang area. This would ultimately lead to civil unrest and there'd be many terrorist attacks occurring again in the Xinjiang region, just like there was four or five years ago before the Chinese authorities decided to do something about it. The bottom line is, it's China's business. China are more than capable of dealing with it. It's their internal problem. They're dealing with it and they don't need any interference from the West. But of course the West wants civil unrest in Xinjiang because this will impede the Belt and Road Initiative. It will impede goods coming in and out of China. They also know that civil unrest in the area will distract the Chinese government, the same plan as they tried in Hong Kong. This is how the US and its allies operate. They've done it many times before, but really people, the population of those Western countries needs to wake up and say, no, enough is enough. We don't want to go down this road again. We know where it leads. All it does is ends up in proxy wars and more military spending. And of course, who are the main beneficiaries of all that additional military spending? Well, it's the US military industrial complex, of course, as well as big tech companies now. It seems in the US that big tech companies are getting even closer and closer to the Pentagon these days. Really, people in the West need to wake up and look at the facts instead of listening to this narrative that is being spoon fed to them by their governments and the media. This narrative is just not true. You know, this is, this is the same all over again as the WMD before the Iraq invasion. It's just not true at all. And all the West is doing is manufacturing consent.
All the West are hoping to do is to destabilize the area of Xinjiang to stop the rise of China. So the West are going to continue to attack and demonize China, hoping that America can stay the world's imperial power for longer. This is typically the US Five Eyes playbook and we all know how it usually ends. However, China are not an Iraq, a Syria, a Venezuela or Russia even. They are much stronger and much smarter. China will have learned the lessons from the former Soviet Union and it's unlikely they will make those same mistakes. China won't allow America to be this bullying world power who just bully other countries by using regime change and their military might. I feel that China are much smarter and they have a much more long-term thinking. Not like the West who have this thinking of three to four year cycles because the parties in power are more interested in getting themselves re-elected than actual proper strategy. Whereas I see China taking a 15, 20, maybe even longer view of things. Anyway, I hope this has given you much more of a factual insight to what's going on here with the Uyghur population. Other places you can look, go and check out Daniel Dumbrell's channel, check Nuance, check Cyrus Jansen's channel. You know, these are all channels that, that talk about this subject. Also, go and have a look at the Grey Zone, Max Blumenthal, Ajit Singh and their co-workers there. Do some really, really good investigative journalism. Anyway, if you did like this video, please, please give us a thumbs up to get it out there, get that algorithm kicking on, on YouTube. If you like the channel in general, consider hitting that subscribe button. Consider supporting us on either Patreon or, or YouTube. But as always, for now, take care.